I'm Joe. For those of you who don't know me, I think I know everybody here. So, hey, buddy. <laughs> Very excited to uh, work through uh, the second chapter of Timothy. But first, let's, uh, let's uh, pray before we get started. Father God, we are so grateful that we get to gather and just be in your word. And Lord, we just are in awe of you and how amazing you are in your love for us. God, I ask that you calm our hearts and our minds. Whatever happened today, let it fall away for a time so that we can be filled with your word and just fill our cups at your feet, Father. Lord, please bless this time that we have together. Let your word speak. Help us to learn all that we can learn through this passage and gain as much understanding as we can. And Lord, we thank you, as always, for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, please, again, bless this time that we have, and we thank you. Amen. All right. So I wrote up on the board here, just to kind of, as a reminder, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Just a reminder of where we are in history and the scope of time. Remember where Paul is writing this letter to Timothy? Around 62 AD, as Timothy, he has placed Timothy in charge of the church in Ephesus. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Not a very long chapter tonight, 15 verses, but a lot of meat on the bone, so to speak. So we're going to go through this. Um, I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to read all 15 chapters, and we're going to kind of go through like we normally do. And then we're going to switch some things up tonight towards the end. Um, and hopefully that'll be a good time for everybody. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Starting in chapter 2, verse 1. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, as I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control and not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but that, that but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a, warm, a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and may, became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. All right, lots going on there, right? Especially that later part. We're going to jump into that a little bit later, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a little tricky, right? But that's okay because we are going to, we're going to walk through it together. We're going to learn together about that. All right, so let's talk about that first part, that first verse, this is a charge to Timothy, right? First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving be made for all people. So he's charging Timothy with this. This is something as a leader that he must ensure that's getting done in that church. He's telling you, I want you to do this. Praying is important. And as I was going through this and studying this and just chewing on this passage over the past week, that's something that kind of came into my mind that as men, you know, as leaders in our homes and in our marriages, we need to ensure that this is happening in our, in our own ministries, right? Especially to our families, right? I think that's important that we, 
put forth a good example of a proper prayer life and that we're doing this and we're showing our kids. I know for me, that's something I haven't been great at, especially like sitting down with my boys and praying with them aloud or sitting down with my wife and holding her hand and, and praying with her together. Um, that's something I think that's important and that's something I think we should keep locked in our, in our minds, especially when we read that, that first part. And then we move on to verse two, and this is where things can get a little tricky, especially in the, and we'll talk about this later, but we're called to pray for who's in charge, right? And this leads to a life that's edifying to God, is what he's saying there. So in Matthew Henry, he's an old dude, okay, really old dude. So he, in his commentary, I found something that I'm gonna read to you guys that I thought was really good. So all men, kings themselves, and those who are in authority are to be prayed for. That's what Paul's saying here. They want our prayers, for they have many difficulties to encounter, many snares to which their exalted stations expose them, which is true. I don't know if many leaders nowadays think about, hey, I could use some prayer, but I'm sure that they're like, oh, this is heavy. So, and then in praying for our governors, we take the most likely course to lead to a peaceable and quiet life. Um, pause there for a second. I need two volunteers to read some passages. Rick, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. You want to do Ezra? Uh, chapter 6, verse 10. So an example here that Matthew Henry uses is that Jews at Babylon were commanded to seek the peace of the city, whether the Lord had caused them to be carried as captives and to pray to the Lord for it, for in peace, therefore, they should have peace. So that's what Paul is saying here. So let me know when you gentlemen are ready. You ready? Verse 7. I would like you to go first. All right. Seek the prosperity of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord in its behalf, for in its prosperity will be your prosperity. Right. So we're called to do that. Whether the situation that we're in now, like especially in America, is not too, you know, some people are pessimistic about it. Things don't feel too great. So, but we're still called to pray for our leaders. And that is, that leads to what he says there in verse two, you know, for those who are in a high position that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Go ahead, Jim, if you have that up. Ezra chapter 6 verse 10. Yes, sir. So that they may be offering incense to the God of heaven and may be praying for the good fortune of the king and his family. Good. Yeah. So then moving on, thank you gentlemen for doing that. So there's just other examples from scripture there like we do that just cements those, these things that Paul's saying are there. They're in God's word and they're true and they're good. So verses three and four, I need three volunteers for that. Who wants to do Ezekiel? Anybody want to get into Ezekiel? All right. Dawson, go ahead. Chapter 18, verse 23. Anybody want to go to 2 Timothy? <laughs> Tim, you want to go there? 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 7. And then I need somebody to go to Hebrews. Tim? All right. The two Tims and a Dawson. All right. <laughs> Man, that's okay. Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 23. All right. That's actually yeah. So 2 Timothy 3, 7, and then Tim Smith, Hebrews 10, 26. So I'm going to reread those two verses there. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of the Lord, who desires all people, uh, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of him in truth. So here he's talking about God's general benevolence and taking no delight in seeing the death of the wicked is what he's doing. So go ahead. <laughs> 23, 18, 23. I think that's right. You got me doubting myself. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, we'll work through. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> Put on another. So he's talking about he, all types of people here that are, God's general benevolence and taking no thrill or delight that people are learning these things and not taking them to heart. Um, so verses five and six, let's move on there. Uh, I just need one volunteer for that. Anybody want to do Matthew? 
Gary, go ahead. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. 20, yes, sir. So I'm going to reread those verses here. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given in the proper time. So here Paul's talking in that first verse there, in verse five, he talks about, did you notice how he said, the man, Christ Jesus? He did that on purpose. He didn't, you know, he, there was a reason why he chose that particular phrasing. Um, it's because at that time, the teaching in Ephesus was there were people teaching that Christ wasn't fully God. And we talked about this before. Um, docetism, right? Where Jesus wasn't fully God, uh, was a spirit. He seemed to be like a man, but wasn't a man. So that's what he's refuting here. And he's talking about how, you know, this thing, this mystery of Christ's human and divinity in one person, right? And that's what he's hitting on. And he's refuting that false teaching by saying that he was man. You know, he wasn't, wasn't some phantasm that came and did all these miracles. He was man. So that's what he's saying there. And then here in six, again, he's given the purpose of Christ. that He came to die and to, uh, to save us and to redeem us. And um, go ahead, Gary, read that for us. Right. Amen. So that's the thing he came to die for us, to redeem us, to redeem those. So any questions so far as we're moving on through there? Yeah, what were yeah. the Jeremiah and Ezra verses? Uh, Ezra uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Mm -hmm. And then it was Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. That's where we were there. Any other thoughts, questions? All right. All right, so Paul's wrapping up that, and then on to the next paragraph. We're going to hit verse 8, and then we'll hop into um, the other verses here. So I desire that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. So he's getting, he's starting to get into some of the more, I don't know, in our eyes, I think in our today society, they're kind of controversial, right? Um, but he's setting this up, that he's saying men and women should be praying together as a part of worship, while also being in the right relationship with each other, and that we should be together in this and united. Here, Paul begins to address the specific problems that are taking place. Remember, he's not writing to every single church everywhere, right? He's writing to Timothy in Ephesus, addressing certain problems. That's what he's doing right here. So he's addressing those specific problems in that church. And the big one in this verse, such as the conflicts between men and as they're that seem to be the preoccupation instead of coming together and praying and lifting holy hands to God, right? And so, and then like we'll see later that preoccupation with appearance, which we'll, like I said, we'll discuss that in a minute. So any other thoughts or questions about that? I think it's vitally important that we remember that as we move on to this is we're talking about things that happen specifically and that he's addressing, but also the big picture Right. I, I, I think it's interesting that that verse comes on the heels of what he was already talking about. Yeah. Praying, praying for our leaders and, you know, yeah. the kings and the government or whatever. And that we, we pray without anger or quarrel. Yeah. You know, because that can lead to so much yeah. you know, division. Yeah. And getting at each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he's addressing are the, the things that are hindering this church from really engaging into good like prayer and worship together. Thank you, Tim. That was good. So let's, uh, I'll go ahead. Let's read. I'm going to read verses 9 through 15 again, and then we're going to talk about them, okay? Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in a respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, in gold or pearls or costly attire, 
but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. Do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then with Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. You guys familiar with this passage? Right? Heard it before. You know, I think a lot of arguments have arisen from it. But, you know, we look at there, that transition, right? Verse 8, he talks about, I desire then that every man should lift hands. So he's talking about what's hindering the men. So then he says, likewise. So these preoccupations with appearance, things that are hindering the women to, that are getting in their way from coming before God and engaging in a holy prayer life. So that's what he's doing. He's addressing that cause of conflict and aiming at that right relationship. So before we dig any deeper, we need to kind of go back, look to the past to understand. And Sam, I asked him to uh, read a passage from Genesis for us. Genesis chapter three, the fall, right? So we're gonna go, go ahead and read that for you. You guys picking up what I'm putting down, right? So that's the context in which we find ourselves. We are fallen. Men and women are not perfect. We, because of this, because of the fall, because of sin, this is where we find ourselves. So I wanted to make sure that we went back and looked at that before we moved forward talking about this passage. So when we look at this, the thing that kind of sticks out to my mind is the word quietly, right? So Sam, I want to thank Sam. He kind of pointed me in the right direction for this because this is tricky, it's a tricky passage. So the word quietly here does not mean that women aren't to talk or to say anything gathered for worship, but this would contradict kind of what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're not, for time's sake, we're not going to go there. We're not going to hit all these references just because I want to keep moving so that we have time to talk and discuss. We're not familiar with verse. So that's, that's what it means. He's talking about, then the word quietly, he's talking about without turmoil. So here he's not saying like, you know, don't, you don't have to be completely silent, but just watch what you're saying and watch what you're doing. And like, um, here quietly, like I said, does not mean complete silence. It means instead that women are to be without turmoil. So does that make sense to everybody? And then we get into that other one, right? With all submissiveness, right? We get into that. So here with that, Paul is teaching and saying that women are not to be contentious or usurp the role of the elders, but to submit to their authority. In a sense, Christian women's obligation is no different than that of a Christian man, right? To submitting to that authority in the church, right? Both men and women are called to submit to the authorities God has placed in the church. Hebrews, you know, 13, uh, verse 7. And then submitting to the authority of the elders, um, came into the world when the serpent strove to assault God's, or I'm sorry, sin came into the world when the serpent strove to assault God's order. So God had a plan. He had things put in place. And then sin came in the world, disrupting and messing up that order. So this is why he permits women from teaching and exercising authority within, gathered, within the gathered assembly. Does that make sense? Right? Everybody's tracking. Okay. So then moving on from that, in Titus 2, we see a command to women about them teaching. Um, so that's one thing that I kind of wanted to touch on is that women are not lower than men. It's not, not it. So if you are reading this and getting that sense or have heard people say, you know, I'm a man, so therefore I'm privy to more learning or I'm in charge or that's not it. Like I have a higher holy standing with God because I'm a man. It's not it at all. People that 
do that, they miss the mark. That's not accurate. That's not correct. Because here we see Christ elevated women far above their social status in the day in which Christ had walked the earth. He called them to sit at his feet and to learn from him and to follow him. That wasn't the norm. Back in that day, the women were to be off and away and not to sit and learn and have that position of, as, as a significant student. So he first, and then who did he first proclaim himself to be Messiah to? Do you guys know? Mary. Yeah. The Samaritan woman of poor reputation. Not some dude high up in the church, not some man who was smart and holy, to a woman. That gets me. I, it always does like that, just how Christ worked and how he did things means so much. He didn't do things without having a reason. So, and then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul goes out of his way to highlight the exemplary faith of this guy's mom and grandma and how important they are. So, and that's the thing that kind of I took away and something that God is not a God of sexism. God created a unique role for men and women to fulfill. And I think that's sometimes what's, what gets missed in this passage. And I think people misunderstand and they think that, you know, that we should be man should lord over his wife. And that's not it. That's not what's being taught here. Yeah, it, it's difficult. I think that's hard, especially. Yeah, I think it can be for both. I do. I think that, I think especially like being a man and like in my own marriage, like there's been times I've struggled with that. Like, you know, I want to have a say in this or that and I feel like I should. And it's easy to take this out of, out of whack and use that and kind of put that in and be like, yeah, but the Bible says that, but I, we have to understand here and what I'm going to touch on in a second is how God intended things to be and how sin has corrupted that. And what Paul is saying here, and that's what Paul is doing, is he's addressing that, that the intended way that God has set up order. So like I said, God is not a God of sexism, but he, God created unique roles for men and women to fulfill. We have made a submission to, uh, to a word to be scorned in, today, in today's world. Like submit, that word submission, people hate it, <laughs> right? <laughs> like if you, I, I know I've had conversations with a buddy of mine who was kind of wrestling with, with this. And he, when we, we were going through books of the Bible, and we, I don't remember, it might've been in Peter, I think he doesn't, is that when he says submit? You know, the word submits used in first Peter, right? Yeah. <laughs> he did not like that because I think our pride gets in the way and we hear that like submit, we have to give something up, right? And we don't want to give anything up. We don't want to give up any control. We don't want to give up any of our pride or any of our power. And that's not what that truly means. And so the word translated submit here means to come under the proper arrangement of God. And I'm going to put a Greek word on here, okay? But that's okay. It's going to be all right. Hypoteso? I think I'm saying that correct. Yeah? I don't know. I'll go ahead. Yeah. Joseph. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Hypoteso, that's what I'm saying. That's what we're going with. So the word hypo here means under, right? And then the word teso, arrangement. I know my handwriting's terrible. I apologize, but I'm 35 years old. It's not changing now. <laughs> so, hypoteso, that means under God's arrangement. So, submitting to the Lord, his plan, under his arrangement. That's what that means. So, the word for commanding husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church is that word agape, which I'm sure we've all heard, which 
kind of totes the love of esteem that one desires the best of the recipient of the love. So the church submits, comes under the proper arrangement, right? To Christ because we know he loves us in this manner. Husbands are commanded to love their wives in this manner. And wives are called to submit to their husbands in light of this. Not a submission that makes you less than within the marriage. So that doesn't mean that, you know, if Leanna, my wife, was to submit to me, that I lord over her. No, that's not what God's saying. Is that she's allowing me to lead our family. And she's agreeing to this proper arrangement. God's arrangement. That's what that means. Not that I'm putting control of her and then I do whatever I want and she just has to listen. The way my marriage works, we're a team, my wife and I. We do things together. We make decisions together. There are some things where she will say, well, what do you think? And I will tell her. And there will be certain times when I ask her, well, what do you think? And we'll work through it. So I, go ahead, Rick. But I think it's also important for us to remember too that our example is Christ and that we're to imitate him. And then like what Gary read, we're we're to imitate service to our wives. We're supposed to help them and be that helpmate back in return and not reap the benefit of that because we're not, we're not the, that's not the level that we're talking at here. So when we read through Romans 16, we see Paul, you know, commending a bunch of women who are integral to the church, who are so important, right? Things that they have done, the ministries they have done. um, Read through that sometime, maybe tonight. Read through Romans. Read through the whole book of Romans tonight if you want to. It's good stuff. I know, I'm just, I'm teasing. It's a lot. (laughs) <laughs> yes, before you go to bed, do that. Um, so on there we hear um, people will sometimes bring up Galatians uh, chapter 3, verse 26 through 29. I'm going to read that. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, uh, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There's neither no male, male or female. And you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So this doesn't negate the roles that God has laid out for men and women. You know, but what this is saying is that it affirms that both men and women are heirs to that promise, right? That's what he's saying here. And then, like we mentioned before in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Paul, you know, tells or is given, not advice, but commands to women on how they are praying and how they are to pray and prophesy and worship. So keep that in mind too, that in this passage, Paul already took it as a given that women are learning, and that they're an active part of the church. They're not stepping back and sitting in the back row and taking care of the children while the men sit up front and glean what they can from Scripture. That's not not what is happening here. So, yeah, and that would have, you know, in all honesty, would have gone against society at that time. So it was different. It was... It wasn't, it wasn't what people make it out to be, that women were sitting in the back of the church not learning and not being an active part of the church. But here, Paul, like I said, Paul is saying, hey, some things are going wrong. Some things are getting in the way between you learning and engaging with God. And he lists those. Modesty and self-control. He talks about the dress and things. Evidently, that was something that was an issue that he knew of and probably was something that was ongoing and he knew it was important to mention to Timothy. Okay, so that's the end of that passage. 
Any thoughts or comments before we move on to discussion questions? All right, cool. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do some things, something a little bit different tonight. We're going to answer one question. We're going to answer that first question there. We're going to take a moment, and we're going to gather into groups, and we're going to pray together as men. I felt it appropriate because I feel like the hinge of this passage is prayer, and he's talking about that, and I think it's important for us to practice that together as men uh, tonight and to engage in that. So let's look at that first question. So in a time where there is a lot of friction and disagreement within where we live in politics and leadership and where we find ourselves, so how can we take this passage to heart and imitate Christ in praying for our leaders? 